In this video, I'm here in the Netherlands to drive a Saab 96. This example dates from 1973. Uh, it is a car that obviously is synonymous with Eric Carlson and the world of rallying. Fascinating bit of design. So very, very Saab, very, very unique styling. And uh, this one, an absolutely delicious 1970s shade. Uh, still clearly uh, inspired by previous Saabs. Uh, the 92 was Saab's first car, uh, developed just after the Second World War. And it had a transverse twin engine, but the same sort of sleek, super aerodynamic looks, which recognized the fact that Saab was a producer of aeroplanes. So in 1956, Saab launched the 93, which was completely reworked. It had a longitudinal engine, both, both that and the 92 have been heavily inspired by DKW. Uh, so the 93 had a three cylinder, two stroke engine behind, uh, well, with the radiator behind it, because the origins were in thermo siphoning uh, before water pumps were very common. And the 93 evolved into the 96 with a larger rear window, but still initially with a two stroke engine. So the first 93s were called bull nose and they had a much shorter nose because they had a fairly small engine, but they extended the nose of those two stroke versions because they knew they were going to have to fit a bigger engine. Although I'm not sure they're entirely fixated on what that was going to be. It ended up being a Ford V4. So let's take a look. Now, anyone who's owned a later Saab will be fully familiar with the bonnet arrangement because you think it's going to lift up in the conventional way, but then it doesn't. Uh, owner Marcel is um, demonstrating how it lifts up and then tips forward. And then under here we can see the Ford V4 engine from um, Ford Germany. It, it's just a strange one looking back, but Ford Germany and Ford UK developed their own V4 engines. Uh, so we've got a gearbox behind driving the front wheels. So it's a 1.5 litre V4 engine developing about 65 brake horsepower for this year. So quite a compact engine and um, the first Ford Transits had a very stubby snout and that's because they also used a V4 engine. It's a compact way of getting a four cylinder in. Unlike Audis, you don't have a huge engine sticking out ahead of the front axle. So it works quite well. And I know Eric Carlson himself, when the V4 was first launched, was all about it because it was such an increase in power from the little two stroke engines beforehand. So this is a later facelift model by which time they'd stuck these chunky indicator side light units on the side plastic grille and uh, larger rear lights as well with um, separate indicators and uh, 96 always had a larger rear window but you can see little aeronautical things just in the overall shape very sleek also things like this there is a little piece of um, glass or pl plastic here to reduce buffeting when you have the window open and the ventilation because the airflow can come out of the car through these little scoops. Uh, this is a Swedish market one, so it hasn't got opening side windows, but that would have been a feature on some of them. Uh, inside, a lot of plastic to reflect the fact this is the 1970s. We've got a nice big steering wheel right in front of us. I love the colors on the, um, the gauges. So it goes up to 160 kilometers an hour, allegedly. A light switch here, a heater fan, heat controls, all dainty here up the side, very small. Uh, just notice we've got the classic Paradise service sticker. I was there just last night. Uh, the obligatory fasten seatbelt warning. Uh, we've got hazard lights over here. Proper indicator noise, excellent. And uh, of course we've got a column gear change, but we've also got stalks, um, wipers this side, indicators that side, and the column gear change uh, is as follows. So first is towards you and up, second straight down, let it ping back up and it goes onto the third, fourth gate. And very simple, so very minimal movement. You can actually operate the gears while keeping your hand on the steering wheel, which I think is a really nice touch. It's also a free wheel. Yeah, there's the free wheel control, this tiny little thing to turn the free wheel in and out. And what the free wheel does, it allows you to coast in gear effectively. So as soon as you lift off the throttle, uh, the clutch disengages. It means you can do clutchless gear changes. We'll be trying that on the test drive later on. 
and it kind of improves your fuel consumption because you're not having to have the engine at high RPM all the time. It doesn't work on modern cars because as soon as you lift off, they cut all the fuel anyway. But it's a legacy of the two-stroke cars because a two-stroke car, if it's not getting fuel, it's not getting lubrication. So the overrun becomes very dangerous. So that's what that's all about. But yeah, these seats, remarkably comfortable, head restraints uh, that are actually designed to properly restrain your head. Uh, this one hasn't even got the stereo, which appears to be in the glove box lid. And there we go, we've got a little glove box for hiding your screwdrivers and fuel filters. But uh, yeah, it's, it's just all very sharp, isn't it? Look at this safety sun visor. I don't know what that means. Maybe it turns into an airbag when you're not looking. And uh, being Sweden, very easy to rotate it to um, the side window position because low sun is such an issue. Now these Saabs never had rear doors, so uh, you have to get mildly athletic, but actually it opens quite a big space to slot yourself in and jump in. I pull the, the seat back with a seat set for me. Legroom is a little on the short side, a bit more child side, and uh, headroom a little tight because the roof, of course, is sloping downwards for that tapered aerodynamic effect. But I've got a little ashtray there, which is quite nice, and this version has got clip-on safety belts fitted. These seat belts are an interesting one. There is no buckle. The belt slides down there, and then you clip it in, and then that's nice and secure, which is a slightly different way of things. These, these sorts of belts were fitted to a number of cars in the 1970s, so at least you haven't got to worry about a buckle flying anywhere and hitting anyone in the face. Of course, inertia reel belts fitted for good old safety. Now the question is, does this tapering design actually give us any boot space? Let's um, have a look, all very deeply mechanical, and look at that. There is uh, actually a surprising amount of space there. It's surprisingly deep, and uh, even got a little system to uh, keep the boot lid from smacking you on the head. Look at that. Perfectly designed, so you just put some weight on it and it folds in, but yeah, lovely. Very typical Saab touch, I think. Just before we go for a drive, we'll just take in the Made in Trollhattan by Trolls sticker. Very fitting. And uh, the owner has been to the Saab Car Museum, which is a place I would very much like to visit. Saab may be defunct in so many ways, but the Saab Car Museum is still going. Uh, theme of this trip, windscreen washer, is a, a bottle um, solution. So we shall apply some liberally to the windscreen. in order to do our windscreen wiper test. Just fire up the engine, and that lumpy offbeat V4 soundtrack, it's almost Subaru. And then we shall wipe. Oh, look at that, we just got enough overlap to avoid a triangle of doom. But would you really expect a poor wiping performance on a Saab? I don't think so. So into first gear, handbrake off. And away we go. Well, first of all, we're going to try and demonstrate the turning circle. Not the most impressive. Into reverse. Make sure I'm... Nope, I find that's fourth. Make sure we don't reverse into one of these beautiful trees. we go so yeah as soon as I lift off we're into a freewheel scenario and I can just come down to second gear with no clutch pedal use and a bit bouncily it re-engages and away we go so lift off wait for the revs to dry down drop down into third and away we go it does take a bit of getting used to because your drive just disappears and then you put your foot down and nothing happens because the free wheel has to reconnect. Now we can put some lights on. There we go. So it's a good way of making stately progress. It's hard to imagine uh, Eric Carlson and later Stig Vlomquist, I think, also drove uh, Saab 96s in rallying, hurtling around forests in these things. Certainly a very different driving experience to the uh, three-cylinder two-stroke models, which make an utterly fantastic noise. Uh, 
delightful little cars. Just feel a little weird to be changing gear without a clutch. Build a little speed up now and there's a little wind noise because we've got the window open on the passenger side, but uh, it's pretty peaceful overall. Occasionally there's a bit of a drone at certain speeds. But yeah, if you're a fan of engine braking, the free wheel probably isn't for you. There's not really that much reason to use it, but apart from cool points. In fact, you don't have to um, use the clutch. But other manufacturers use free wheels. Ro Rover used it on the P4, quite surprisingly. No reason to, there was never a two-stroke P4. And I once drove a 1930s Morris Oxford Empire Saloon that had a free wheel, which given it had a right-hand brake pedal was quite terrifying. It's quite a pleasant sounding engine. Uh, oh, it's going to test the suspension over a gentle speed hump. It's a bit bouncy. Are you okay in the back? <laughs> but there's such strength built into these cars. Uh, Eric Carlson's nickname was Eric on the roof because he did roll these cars quite often and they always survive. Maybe the odd minor dent, but there's a lot of strength built into the A-pillars in a way that was very unusual for the time. It's quite a heavy car, over 900 kilos. Might slow down a bit more for this one. Bit bouncy over those dreaded Dremples. But yeah, very different driving experience because you've actually got actual torque which the two strokes don't tend to have quite so much of. They were only 841 cc. Through the slalom. Yeah, a fair bit of body roll, but steering's nice and accurate, so you can really feel what's going on. onto a faster road. Yeah, it's not really a performance machine. It does gather pace quite nicely and uh, now we're going to see how much pace we can gather. That's 80 kilometers an hour, which is 50 miles an hour. Oh, that's a boom, but we're through the boom. Yeah, it's a bit revvy at 100 kilometers an hour, but it kind of feels like it could do it all day. It goes a lot quieter when you lift off, of course, because the freewheel kicks in again. Yeah, you can hear that V4 engine thrumming away. That engine was used in quite a lot of different cars as well. It was used in the uh, in, I think slightly larger 1.7 form in the Matra M530, one of which we saw just the other day. V4 was a fairly short-lived fad, really, for Ford. Uh, later just went down the conventional route of straight four engines instead. One thing I forgot to demonstrate is the eccentric mechanism on the window. It sort of tilts down at the back and pivots around this point at the front, always leaving that maximum down. Again, to just help uh, minimise wind noise, I believe. But yeah, there aren't many cars that have a mechanism quite so eccentric. They are lovely cars to drive, and a bit like um, Mercedes-Benz cars of this era, it just makes you not want to necessarily rush. And the Netherlands is quite a good country for not rushing in. Yeah, the gearing is very low, so you could kind of find yourself having to change gear quite soon. So 
So if you do use the clutch, which of course you can do, you can kind of do quicker changes, but there is a bit of a lag as you release the clutch pedal and the free wheel is still engaged. Now these cars were very popular, a number sold in the uh, UK including the 95 Estate car with its fantastic rear fins. They were very popular and you used to see them all over the place but sadly Rust has claimed rather a lot of them I think. And while there's collector interest definitely uh, appearing for the two-stroke models, the V4s are lacking a little behind I think. No not as cool as the earlier two strokes and not as cool as the later 99 and 900 either. That makes them a very hub nut vehicle. But yeah, you can actually lean on it in the bends quite nicely. It feels very um, secure in terms of road holding. Though amusingly, Eric Carlson used to modify his uh, he would fill it with as many people as he could find and then thrash it down a forest track which would bend the rear axle and give it a bit more negative camber on the back. Different times. So there we go, that was a really rather delightful Saab 96 in V4 flavour. I hope to add a two-stroke to the list before too long but still, the lovely car to drive, lovely column gear change and that quirky free wheel makes it um, a very unusual driving experience. So thanks very much to Marcel for letting me drive this car. Thank you for watching. Don't forget, you can head to the Hubnut store if you would like to buy some lovely merchandise. And I'll see you in a future video. Farewell. Sadly, the headlamp wipers have been removed.